Sydney mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of Two Points of View at Two. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we've delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. We have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. In this session, uh, Rex is happy, Rex, me, <laughs> am happy to uh, welcome Phil Liu. Uh, Phil's bio describes him as an adventurer, traveler, and explorer with a day job at ExpoSoft, where he is the CEO. And he is definitely a traveler because I've run into Phil in, in uh, all sorts of places around the world. Last time, I think, it was Kuala Lumpur. At, Ex at ExpoSoft, he executes the company's vision by working with companies to examine their software QA and testing processes, not only from outside the box, but with no box. Starting with quick hit, quick, quick hit improvement actions, Phil works out roadmaps for continuous improvement. An avid international speaker, reader, cyclist, and traveler, he's open to tantalizing discussions on anything. And the anything that we came up with here has to do with uh, the, the international uh, nature of, um, of uh, testing lately. So we'll, uh, we'll jump right into that. If you have any questions during the course of this webinar, uh, feel free to submit them at any time. But uh, please note that they will be answered at the end. So... Let me get the get the slide up here. Hiring and managing international teams. So, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of distributed work being done, and there are various challenges. So, uh, Phil, why don't we we start off with something that's probably sort of a universal challenge, whether it's uh, international or or not, which is the telecommuting versus agile <laughs> topic. Um, I was, I mean, the, the, some of the purists are real hardcore about this. Of, you know, you've got, everybody's got to be co-located. And uh, I heard Alistair Coburn once say at a conference, which, ironically enough, a conference in Kiev, uh, which was all staffed by people doing remote work, I think. He said that if you're not doing co-located work, you're not doing agile. Um, and I, I get that he can say that, but, you know, I've got clients and, and maybe you do too where they're doing Agile, but there's plenty of telecommuting and remote work going on. So so what are you seeing? Well, you know, that's an interesting, uh, really cool topic. And I think that what we have to do is really think about what Agile really is and how you define it, if at all. Um, if you remember, the Agile Manifesto come out, it came out in 2001. Yeah. And that was really kind of the beginning of globalization and at that point globalization really meant uh, trading and then it was migrating into outsourcing and so there was a little bit of a kickback against that and you know people wanting to be co-located and so forth but you know co-location and does not necessarily or not being co-located does not prohibit agile agile is really about collaboration and because of today's tools and technologies available We've surmounted that actual problem of having to be physically located, you know, and um, so I, you know, I'd have to disagree with that. Whoever I can't remember the person that you mentioned about, you know, if you're not co-located, you're not doing agile. I think yeah. that there's plenty of tools and, and methods, and um, the physical part of it uh, is not really a stumbling block anymore or a you know obstacle at yeah. all. The guy, the guy is Alistair Coburn, who's one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. For what, for what's that worth? Whatever that's worth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I get that he gets to say that because he's Alistair Coburn and he signed the Agile Manifesto and he was in the room, you know. But I have plenty of clients that that say they're doing Agile and they use distributed or international teams. They allow telecommuting. They're not all co-located, and it seems to be working just fine for them. So. You know, from a purely engineering point of view, where you know you, you focus on what works, not what dogma is, it, it seems to me the the right way to go. Well, I mean, there's two other things going against the grain of of true physical colocation, and one of them is that um, millennials don't want to go into the office, and people want flexibility. And how do you deal with that and still be able to utilize talent wherever it happens to be? You know, yeah. and, and 
you don't have people that you know want to go into the office every day. That's just the way it is these days, and we have to deal with that and make the best of it. Yeah, very, very true. Or if they do have to go into the office, uh, they, they insist on bringing their dog, um, which is fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've seen people bring dogs and even have, uh, you know, have their kids there. All, you know, everybody's all together. So. Yeah, <laughs> talk about co-located. <laughs> That's right. That's the, right. The whole, the whole team is there, and the whole family. That's right. That's yeah. right. So. Um, Something else that I'm sure you've had a lot of, of experience uh, dealing with uh, in, in these kind of situations uh, where, where you have to deal with disparate teams is, is how, to, how to use collaboration tools to try to, to deal with that, that distance. And, you know, I've seen this done, done well, and I've, I've seen it done poorly for sure. Um, you know, lots of, lots of email, of course, is one of the more painful ways of trying to deal with it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, all the way up to these telepresence screens that you know are mm -hmm. just like being there. So, mm -hmm. what what kind of things are are you guys using at Expo so often? What are you seeing with your clients? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, yeah, we have actually had some issues with that in terms of having too many emails. And you mentioned you know the email chains just get too long, and uh -huh. you spend uh, spending hours not only reading the email, but going back and see what was the original email and, you know, what, what the whole chain of knowledge or train of thought going through that whole email. And sometimes that even what happens is the subject of the email changes from the subject line, right? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, what we did with our client was we said, hey, you know, these emails just aren't working for either of us. We're spending a lot of time trying to read through these things and figure out the whole train of thought and so we stopped, uh, actually, we stopped doing emails. And what we do is, is a, we use a collaboration tool um, that actually, you know, tracks the train of thought throughout the whole, I guess you could say, conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, we use, we happen to use a tool called Bitrix. We use that and then we use uh, chats, you know, just Skype or whatever chat tool. And instead of using email, because it just kind of gets too cumbersome and too long, you know, you have 30 emails in a chain. It's just really hard to follow. Yeah, I for a while I was trying to adopt this no third reply rule with emails here at RBCS. And, it, and that, that helped oh. us get better, which basically was anything. If it gets to the point where you're about to be the third reply on an email, pick up the phone, you know, take it. Mm needs to become some kind of face-to-face -face communication or something other than email because, mm -hmm. yeah, just that, those endless email threads and back and forth and back and forth. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you're as busy as I am. So I always right. find it really frustrating to to open up my my email and then see that there's, you know, this, this ping pong match that's been going on and, and I'm now – you know, people are blocking, waiting for me to be available and just right. creates this sense, this unnecessary sense of pressure. And, you know, and then, of course, the communication isn't really done real well. Right. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's all yeah, about think... emptying the inbox rather than, you know, engaging in a, in a really good discussion on a point. Yeah, I think that's a good point is that um, a lot of times you just have to say, hey, let's have a phone call do it the good old fashioned way. And yep. you can. You can solve. You can uh, get rid of 30 emails with five minutes on, uh, actually talking on the phone. Yeah, and of course, it also reduces the the risk of of misunderstanding. You know, I'm sure you've seen situations where somebody misunderstands something in an email. Sometimes that's got some sort of emotional ballast associated with it, and then it's you know you're just off to the races with this really counterproductive and enervating email sequence and people are arguing and fighting, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, email is never good for anything other than really, uh, you know, short facts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Emotions yeah. can get into it and have miscommunications and hurt feelings. And it's just, uh, can be a snowball. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> speaking of like communications and such, uh, you know, I know that, um, you and I both yeah. do a lot of international business, international speaking, and so forth. Uh, uh, 
what are your thoughts on on English? Because it's sort of it's it's an international language, kind of. But I mean, I've, have you noticed the same things that I've noticed where it, it, you can have two people speaking English to each other and they're talking right past each other because of various dialects or cultural uh, elements? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, when I talk to our folks, you know, we have quite a few of our testers in China, as you mentioned earlier, and um, there's a big difference between speaking English and communicating. And um, yeah. so, you know, I, I, I really work on, on, on with them on, on listening skills and trying to figure out, trying to help them to um, really learn what the message is, what, you know, and what the customer or client really wants rather than the actual words. Um, and I think a lot of times there's two, two problems. One of them is that people that are not native English speakers, they, they have a canned responses that they have without thinking too much about them. And the second thing is they're already trying to think of what to say before they're listening carefully to what the client says. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to do those two things at the same time, that, that doesn't work quite well. So, you know, my advice is, you know, for those that are um, having English as a second language, that as you said, we all have to speak English, whether or not it's second or first language, because it has become the international language, you know, is to really practice listening skills and to um, listen before speaking, even though, you know, as a, as a non-native speaker, you're always working on you know, what am I going to say next and how am I going to say it and so forth? Really listen first. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great point. You know, I, um, I speak a, a little Spanish. Um, and so, you know, I go, when I go to countries where the Spanish speaking countries, uh, one of the things that I, I always get to rediscover is that it's not speaking a language is hardly a binary thing. It's not like either you do or you don't speak the language, right? There's what, how much of the language do you know? You know, and I can, I can, I can order dinner. Um, I can uh, get, get in a taxi and get, you know, tell the taxi driver where I want to go and, and, and have various kinds of basic conversations in Spanish. And, and that sometimes gets me into trouble because they'll assume that I can actually speak it reasonably well. And then they'll start to show mm -hmm. me with, uh, with, you know, 200 mile an hour Espanol. And I'm like, ah, no, nah, no, nah, más despacio, which means more slowly, you know? Right. And then I get into business settings and I'm trying to, to have a conversation and I'll usually say, well, you know, we could try it in Spanish, but you know, yeah, there's a lot of it that I just, that, that, that won't work. And I have to switch back into, into English. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's um, yeah. I think it's really important to be aware of that. Uh, you know, the degree to which the person you're speaking with actually speaks English or whatever the language is that you're. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm I think that. Um, uh, so that brings up another issue: is that the person that is in a in a two-person or multi-person dialogue, the ones that do have English as their first language, they really have to be aware of their speed of language, of the speed of their they're talking, but also the the idioms and their usage of the language, um, and so that's something that uh, you know comes with time, but it's something that has to be done. Yeah, you, yeah, you really have to be you have to be looking at the person that you're talking to or the people that you're talking to, engaging their mm -hmm. their comprehension, and yeah, avoiding avoiding things like sports metaphors and so forth, which just never exactly. never translate well. Is really right. Important. right. And, you know, what helps that is that, you know, and what we do with our, our folks is that we actually have them come and visit our clients and our, our clients come to visit us as well to develop that relationship mm -hmm. um, so that we have that context together in what they understand and what they don't understand. And that really helps a lot. So, you know, it's not total telecommuting, you could say, but, you know, it, uh, we do have to have some face, face contact because that relationship is really important. Yeah, I, I agree. I learned that early on in, in my experience with doing overseas testing and project works of, you know, if you think you're going to do it all remotely without building face-to-face -face relationships, that's, yeah, it isn't going to work out well. That's right. That's for sure. Yeah. Hey, have you um, seen in, in um, 
with with your your folks in China, uh, different expectations in terms of of career paths? Because I've kind of noticed this doing. You know, I do I do a lot of speaking and training work around the world, and um, you know, it seems like uh, people's people's career expectations can vary quite a bit from from one place to another as far as you know where they're going to go in in testing. Yeah, that's a good question. And you know, as far as um, uh, is when I look at the when I go up go into our office and I look at all the testers sitting there working, I notice that most of them are women. And um, mm -hmm. you know, and I talk to our HR folks about that. And and the reason is that the the men they all want to be developers. <laughs> huh. So yeah. so. Um, or they, if they come in as a tester, they aspire to be a developer, okay? Uh -huh. And so the testing profession has really become a female-dominated profession. Um, so it's good if you're a, a single guy working in our office, I guess. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, that, I think that's good for us. Our, you know, our, our testing team is very, very stable, and you know, I think a lot of that is because they're primarily women. I think that could vary a lot around the world, though. You know, um, you're exactly right. Yeah. I think now I'm thinking back, like Malaysia. I, I think at Kuala Lumpur, I would guess that that was, you know, about a third women in the audience there. Um, That's right. It's probably the opposite in some other countries. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Um, oh, let's see. Middle East. When I've done work in the Middle East, it's it. it varies um quite a bit as you can imagine um yeah I, so i think that's yeah it's kind of uh, kind of interesting as to like gender preference um and or gender distribution and in, in testing it's um i think that's one of the that is a big variable that i've noticed around the world mm -hmm. um, and the, the other thing is you know what they what they see is their career path in testing as well, and how mature testing is uh, in, in QA in that in that country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of it's funny. It's sort of on a on it's it's on a different wavelength in the different countries. You know, of like uh, here, it's been popular for for quite some while, uh, at least mm -hmm. ten or fifteen years for someone to pop up at a, a at a testing conference ironically enough every couple of years and yell testing is dead <laughs> you know and, uh, <laughs> say, what <laughs> yeah and they'll be like, what what is dead but you know I mean there's, there's a lot of hand wringing over what's DevOps going to do to testing what's agile going to do to testing and so forth whereas you know I go to to uh, other countries where uh, they're big uh, locations for for outsourced testing and you know, they're they're like, hey, no, testing is testing is great. You know, and it's it continues if you look at the numbers, um, which I'm sure you do for you know like international um, outsourcing of testing. It continues to be a growing industry. Right, right, and and the other the other point is that hiring and recruiting and managing um, testers in different locations is is a totally different ball game as well. Sure. Um, Different um, expectations of what they, you know, want in their career. Different, different expectations of what they think their career path is. A lot of different things to consider. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, what 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 constitutes a successful hire? You know, is going to potentially vary because because of those differences in expectations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know yep. in, in India, it's a case where people. People come into a job and fully expect to only be there for a couple of years, you know. Whereas, if, if, if that long, if that long, right? <laughs> whereas I think, you know, for a lot of a lot of uh, my clients, they would say, "Gee, well, you know, when the time somebody's been there for two years, they're just really reaching their stride," you know. Right. Yeah, that's true. So you have to really, when you're hiring, you know, you gotta you gotta look at that those expectations in, in a culturally uh, sensitive way, I guess. Right. Right. I think, you know, what, what that means really is for those locations that have, or those countries that have high turnover is to really think about, um, you know, tra good training systems for training people, getting up to speed and productive as fast as possible. 
in order to you know because you can't fight the turnover but you can you can deal with it right so those are the kind of things you have to think about yeah yeah absolutely well great so uh, I thought what do we do at this point Phil is um, open it up we got a we got some questions um, so I thought we'd uh, maybe take a look at some of these questions okay. um, we got a question here from Tony who says, uh, any tips for test teams collaborating across multiple time zones? I'll let you get started with that one. Okay. Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, when you're dealing with multiple time zones across different groups, everybody has to basically bend a little bit. And uh, so we've actually worked with um, uh, development teams in India where we've got them as well as our end customer, which is in California. And so there's three of us working together on, uh, on a project, and, and basically we all have to kind of bend our hours a little bit. And, <laughs> um, you know, somebody has to get up early and somebody has to stay up late. That's just the way it is. And we, can, we take turns at altering so that, um, you know, one person is or one part of the team is not always staying up till midnight. But um, those are the, you know, I guess you could say the trade-offs of working at home, uh, quote unquote, right? You, you have some sacrifices to make. Yeah, I, I've I've heard some some interesting stories about this. I had a guy, um, they were, he was a director of QA at this uh, industrial controls systems place, and uh, um, it, this guy they were doing a lot of their testing was outsourced in, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. and, um, so apparently like every, it was once a week or twice a week. And I can't remember, I, but I think it might've been Monday morning when this would happen. Uh, they, they would have this meeting that was the end of the day in the Philippines, but for everybody in, in Texas and, and Austin where they were, it was seven o'clock. Uh -huh. So he was making his entire t leadership team and the QA team be in the uh -huh. office at 7 a.m. on Monday, every Monday morning. And everybody except for him hated that. He was one of those guys that, like, you know, just naturally he wakes up at, like, 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And, uh -huh. and, you know, so he would just get up and drive to the office anyway at 6 o'clock. And, and so being on a 7 a.m. call was nothing for him. and. Mm -hmm. Every one of his guys that I talked to, his, his uh, management, test management team, just hated that meeting. You know, so mm -hmm. it's definitely a, a case study in in how not to do it, right? Of like, just do it, do it the way you when you want to do it, you know, and then let everybody else deal with it because they're not going to be very happy. Right. Well, that kind of gets back to what I was talking about before in terms of us vis visiting our clients and our clients visiting us so that we could be with each other and be able to step into each other's shoes, not only from a point of view as, you know, direct face-to-face -face communication, but um, really understanding, you know, how we work together and um, in terms of being able to, to swap things back and forth, I think, you know, the empathy factor is really important there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh I got a question from Lindsay here, uh, uh -huh. and uh, good to hear from you, Lindsay. Hope everything's going well there. Um, she says, uh, do you have any advice or thoughts around managing a remote team without going so far as to become their people managers? Um, I think the distinction she's drawing there is, you know, we manage their tasks, but we don't manage their, their staff. Um, so she, she adds, where and how do you draw the line between coordinating a group of remote testers versus managing them directly? Mm. Uh, Good one. I'm not sure. Maybe you could start on that and I could sure. chime in, Rick. Not quite sure. Yeah. So so I think I think where you're I think where Lindsay's going here is that um, we've got we've got some tests that need to be run and we have a remote testing resource. And what we want to do is, is hand off that work to them in a way that we know it's going to get done. We can be confident that they're going to get it done. But at the same time, we don't want to have to get into managing the people directly. Um, and I've certainly dealt with this a number of times in my career of, 
you know, you, you have to have those clear channels of communication uh, between both sides. Some of it can be enabled by tools. Um, in fact, I would say tools are, are really ideally going to be used because when I've tried to do this in a semi-manual way of coordinating work using spreadsheets and stuff, it's a nightmare. But uh, uh, yeah, a smooth process for, for dividing up the work to figure out who should do what and then parceling out the work, handing off the work to the people who are supposed to do it, and then getting those test results of various kinds funneled back through the appropriate systems, I would say, are probably the the key things to me. Um, and then in terms of not managing their people, I think this, again, is, is it gets to having good communication with the appropriate points of contact of the remote um site you know that that i yeah. don't i don't have to I, I don't have to find out that you know one of the people on the team was out sick for two days because that's all going to be that's right locally right right i mean uh if you're dealing with a remote team that's working that's doing qa for you you know the way that we work with our customers or our clients is you know, we don't want them to have to worry about managing our people. They give us a job to do and we get it done. And, you know, they don't worry about how many hours we put in or um, uh, that's that, that shouldn't be for them to worry about or that shouldn't be something that Lindsay should worry about, right? That she should be worrying about uh, defining the task in such a way uh, that it's clear enough for the for the remote team to understand it. And as far as dividing up the work, that's not something that, uh, Lindsay should have to worry about. Uh, she should only be thinking about um, what kind of results do I expect and when do I expect to get the results. Yeah, so to, for a clear, clear handoffs in both directions, basically. So while it's in, uh, it's on the other side, you're not worrying about it. Basically, while the testing work is being done, it's not. Right. You don't have to get into the sausage making. Right. I think if you don't do the first part well and you don't define the, the results part well, then you have to worry about the in-between stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that kind of, that's kind of the way it works, I would think. Yeah, and that can be kind of symptomatic of, the, of a failure to properly hand it off. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you're, right. if you're getting sucked into a lot of that kind of how the sausage is to be made stuff, um, then that, that can be a, a warning sign of, hey, we should have done a better job of of defining this that's right mm -hmm. are you getting into those uh you know those analogies now that people that don't speak native english you know, uh, that, yeah that's, be careful well yeah no actually i think that's <laughs> although everybody makes sausage i guess well then well that's a it's a it's a german thing right because that that quote, <laughs> that quote is from bismarck about okay. those who enjoy sausage and respect the law should never watch either being made <laughs> <laughs> okay so oh, anyway, I, I blame Bismarck, but you're right. Yeah, it's easy to slip into that. We have a dissenting voice here, uh, Phil, from Brian, who says, uh, um, <laughs> we have weekly conference calls to catch up with our foreign team, but I can't understand them, so I prefer emails. <laughs> so, I'm sure you've been well, on some conference calls like that where it's just like this scratchy, heavily accented voice at the other end, and you're like, oh, man. This is not going well. <laughs> well, you know, you, you have to do both. We, yeah. we do both. Um, you know, one of them is to, to sometimes clarify, but the other part is to uh, uh, the, the voice part of the, the conference call part is actually, it's part of establishing a relationship. That's just sure. the way it works. Yeah, I would say that maybe they should look at the, the way that those conference calls are being done. There's, you know, there's some ways of, de if it's, you know, if you've got bad audio, there's some ways of trying to deal with that. Right, right, of course. I mean, we've used many different technologies, and, it, um, you know, you just have to experiment to find which one is best. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay says, excellent answers. Thank you both. You're welcome, Lindsay. Um, so we're at, the, we're at the end of our of our allotted time here, Phil. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you um, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and I hope all of you out there listening enjoyed this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS, we are a not-just-for-profit company. 
If you enjoy our free webinars and feel that they demonstrate solid insights into the kinds of testing challenges you face, please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor uh, for expert services, consulting, or training, but not outsourcing. That's you want to talk to Phil about. Uh, <laughs> we're, okay. we're happy to provide a quote uh, for any such help that you might need and uh, contact us, info at rbcs-us.com. Uh, Phil, thanks again for... Uh, for uh, agreeing to take a half an hour out of your, your conference day to, to be part of this, and uh, hope you have a, a good rest of the day. Okay, thanks a lot, Rex. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Phil. See you later. Bye. Bye.